We live in an uncommon time. This past week, liberal elites from around the world came to what is known as World Economic Forum. They're the group that gave us the Great Reset. And they came together with the stated purpose of shaping the global agenda. And in these meetings, I actually saw a video of this, maybe some of you did as well. They had a pagan shaman stand up before them. And she had a painted face, she had a headdress, and she began to invoke the presence of her pagan deities. And then she began to pray her own prayer of spells over the individual participants that were there for the World Economic Forum. It is an uncommon time. There is uncommon evil. There is uncommon wickedness. There is uncommon ungodliness. And there is an uncommon need for righteous, holy men and women of God who will take up the mantle of prayer and pray uncommon prayers to see God's kingdom come and God's will be done in the earth. Because whether you know it or not, we're in a battle. We're in a war. That's why Paul said to fight the good fight of faith. But in Ephesians 6, he makes it clear that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. Beyond the veil, beyond what we can see with our physical eyes, there is a spiritual realm. And that spiritual realm is just as real as the natural realm. And so Paul says we need to take up the whole armor of God. And he talks about taking on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and having our loins girt about with truth, having our shoes of peace, taking the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the purpose for all of this we see in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always. We're to armor up so we can be prepared to pray. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. When it says all prayer, in the NIV it says all kinds of prayer. And I think that's the idea because there are different kinds of prayer. Of course, there's consecration prayer where you consecrate yourself to the Lord, much like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. I've been trying to get into the habit of every day when I get up in the morning to get on my knees and simply consecrate my life and my day to Jesus Christ. There's an invocation prayer where you invoke the presence of God in a situation. Of course, God is everywhere, but you're saying, God, I want your unique presence here or invoking a blessing. That actually is a kind of prayer. My favorite kind of prayer is communion where we fellowship with God, we talk with God. It's, it's a moment-by-moment, day-by-day experience. It's stopping just to give Him praise and glory and thank Him for His goodness and His love. Meditation is even a form of prayer, where you roll around in your mind thoughts about God, where you ponder the Scripture. That is actually a form of prayer. The prayer of agreement. Jesus said, if any two of you on earth agree as touching anything, it shall be done by my Father which is in heaven. And then, of course, there's intercession where we stand in the gap for others, where we pray for others. But I want to talk to you about a very specific kind of prayer today. I want to talk to you about warfare prayer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, Paul writes, for though we walk in the flesh, and we do, we live in these material bodies and we interact with material things, but there's more than the material. There is an invisible spiritual realm. So though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not material. They're not physical. They're not things you can hold with your hands, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. I think C.S. Lewis put it well. He said, prayer is fundamentally a warfare activity. It's praying that the will and purpose of God be done in a world that isn't seeing the will and purpose of God being done. John Piper said, the number one reason prayer doesn't work for saints is because we've taken a wartime walkie-talkie and turned it into a domestic intercom. Prayer is to be used to wage our spiritual battle because we are in a fight. We are in a warfare. We are in a battle. 
Because there are unseen forces, demonic powers that many people don't even recognize that Jesus said want to kill, steal, and destroy. And so we are in a fight. We're in a fight for our mental health sometimes. We're in a fight against principalities and powers. We're in a fight, as Nehemiah said, for our families. We're to fight for our families. We're to fight for our neighbors. We're to fight for those that are away from God, for prodigals and for the lost. We're to fight for our nation. We're to fight for the kingdom of God to be revealed in this earth. We're to fight that his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the fight that we're in. And thankfully, God has given us weapons of warfare. He's given us prayer weapons. And today, I want to look at five prayer weapons that I encourage you, every one, every one of you, to engage with to see victory in this spiritual battle. Because we do not need to be defeated. Because the weapons of our warfare are mighty. And the first weapon of our warfare is praise, worship, and thanksgiving. Now, I know that should be a regular part of all of our prayer lives. We are to worship God. We're to adore Him. We're to recognize His greatness and just simply worship God for who He is. And then we're to praise Him. We're to praise Him for His mighty acts and deeds. We're to praise Him for what He's done. But we're then to also thank Him for what He's done specifically for us. However, even though that is how we commune with God, how we worship and praise Him on a daily basis, it is also a weapon. God has made praise as a weapon. And I think you can see it in the historical account found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's important to understand that throughout the Old Testament, you see these physical battles, but really ultimately, like in our day, they're spiritual battles. They're spiritual battles because the pagan gods of those who were the enemies of Israel are coming to confront Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so it is really a spiritual battle, and that's what's going on here. Jehoshaphat was a godly king. He was in Jerusalem when suddenly he is being attacked. It's a surprise attack. Most of his military is on the border between Israel and Judah, and so he is not prepared for this. He's not ready for this. And suddenly in this sneak attack, you have these various armies joining together to come against him, and he doesn't know what to do. And he says, Lord, I don't know what to do. He says, but my eyes are on you. And they begin to seek the Lord, and God gives them a prophetic word. He speaks to them by his spirit. And they're told to go into battle with the Levites in the front, worshiping and praising God for his goodness and mercy. And they send forth the sing praisers, the worshipers. And as they do, the enemy is confused and completely defeated as they destroy themselves. Now, that is a picture that is quite beautiful for us, that through our praise and worship, our enemy can be defeated. I think you see a similar story in the New Testament in Acts chapter 16. Much different setting. You have Paul and Silas. They're missionaries. They're going to a place called Philippi. There in Philippi, they begin to preach the gospel, and they're having some effect until <laughs> there is a demonized woman who follows them around, and, and she is taunting them, and suddenly Paul is annoyed. And I've always appreciated that because when I get annoyed, I don't feel alone. Paul was annoyed. And so he turns to the spirit. He didn't turn to the woman. He turned to the spirit because it was a spirit that was oppressing the woman. And he commanded the spirit to be driven out in the name of Jesus. Well, that's wonderful. The problem is she was trafficked. She was owned by a syndicate. And because of her demonization, she had unusual supernatural powers. And people looked to her as a shaman. They looked to her as a fortune teller. And they were getting their fortunes told. And they were paying money. And so this syndicate is very upset because they've lost the profit that this woman was bringing them. And so they come after Paul and Silas through the court system, and they throw them into prison, even into the dungeon of the prison. And there, in the middle of the prison, the common response would have been to moan and complain and talk about what a victim you were and how God let you down. But they had an uncommon response, and we find it here in Acts 16, verses 25 and 26. It says, at midnight, 
Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. That's their response. They're praising and worshiping God. And the prisoners were listening to them, which means they were praising God with a loud voice. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. That's a physical example of what spiritually happens in the realms of darkness as we praise and worship God. Chains are broken. The darkness trembles before the power of Almighty God. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. One of the ways to resist him is with praise and worship. I believe that's why the enemy is always trying to get us not to praise and worship God. To say, well, that's not becoming, or you don't need to do that, or, or you should be depressed. There's no reason to worship God. When praise and worship is the answer for our victory. There's a story that Derek Prince tells. Derek uh, is a man that I've learned much from his teaching over the years. He's now passed on to be with the Lord. But Derek has this interesting story of when he first went into ministry, and he had a home Bible study. And one day at the home Bible study, a woman shows up with her husband. And her husband had been in prison. And she said, I brought him here for you to help me see him get free because he's demonized. He has demons. And, and it's affecting everything in our lives. And so Derek didn't know what to do. He said, well, why don't we all just take some time to praise and worship God? And they all began to praise and worship and exalt God. Well, this man went crazy. He started screaming and yelling. He put his hands over his ears and he said, stop, stop, stop. I can't take this. I'm going to have to leave. And here's what Derek Prince said very wisely. He said, if you leave, your demons will leave with you. If you stay, you're going to be free from them. And he stayed. And after a little while, he began to shout and jump and dance. And he said, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Because praise is a powerful weapon. It forts the enemy. It drives back the powers of darkness. Psalm 8.2 says, praise stills or stops the enemy and the avenger. In Psalm 22.3, it says that God is enthroned in the praises of Israel. When we praise God, he makes a throne in our praises and it sends terror into the camp of the enemy. I love Psalm 149. I believe David wrote this psalm. And beginning in verse 6, he says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind the kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor has all the saints praise the Lord. He says our praise is a weapon. It's a two-edged sword. It drives back the powers of darkness. Principalities and powers are forded through our praise. So right now, let's take a quick praise break. Father, we praise you. Lord, I pray for those feeling discouraged, depressed, defeated today. We lift up our praise. We choose to do the uncommon thing, to praise and worship God, the creator, the almighty God, the all-wise God, the all-powerful God, the God who has conquered sin and death the God who is resurrected from the dead, the God who's coming back again for his church. Lord, we praise the name of Jesus. We exalt the name of our God. You are worthy and worthy of praise. Praise the name of Jesus. The second weapon is scriptural declarations and prophetic decrees. Now, the word of God is powerful. I encourage you to pray the scripture. Because again and again, the scripture tells us that God will answer our prayers when we're praying according to his will. And we find his will in his word. So for me personally, I have written down dozens of prayers based on the scripture. Some of them are basically just quoting the scripture. And when I read the Bible, and I encourage you to do the same, I'll often stop and turn my reading into prayer time. Because the scripture is so powerful. It is a weapon. God's word is a powerful weapon. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23 calls it fire and a hammer. In Ephesians 6, Paul calls it the sword of the spirit. 
In Hebrews 4.12, it's described as a two-edged sword. You know that in the wilderness, when Jesus was tempted of the devil, he used that sword. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written, and he used the word of God to slice up his enemy and to experience a victory. Amos chapter 3 verses 7 and 8 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? God has anointed us to be able to prophesy. Something you need to understand is I do believe in the ministry office of the prophet. I also think it's often abused. Whatever a prophet does should be in line with the scripture. And if it isn't, let me just say, they are actually a non-profit organization. Because true prophets of the Bible always line up with the scripture. And it's more foretelling what God says than foretelling the future. Some of that can be really quite demonic and certainly quite fleshly. But a prophet is a true prophet person that stands in an office that God has ordained. However, all of God's people can prophesy. You see, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God only came on three groups of people, the prophet, the priest, and the king. But today, I want you to understand that all of us are priests. We don't have to go to a priest. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. We can go directly into the throne of God. Also understand that you are kings. In fact, Ecclesiastes says, where the word of a king is, there is power. Why? Because we're God's representatives in the earth. He is the great king, but he has delegated authority to us, his kingly authority, so we can serve as kings in the earth. Also, we are to prophesy. What does that mean? It means that God prompts us to speak his word. He gives us a word by his spirit to proclaim. And I think where he primarily does this is in prayer. That while we're praying, God will drop a word into our spirit. He'll bring a scripture back to us. And when we declare that word, we are proclaiming the word of God in the situation. And when we do that, some incredible things happen. In Job chapter 22, Job is going through a very difficult time, as many of you know, but a man named Eliphaz comes along with two other friends. And these three friends, Job calls miserable comforters. And if you read Job 22, you see that what he's saying is very good. It's true, but it's not true of Job. You know, you can speak the truth, but it not be the right truth for the right situation. He is using the word of, words really that are very in alignment with Scripture to judge and to condemn Job, and it's completely wrong. But what he's saying is true, and he makes a profound statement in Job twenty-two twenty-eight from the New American Standard Version. He says, you will also decree a thing, and it will be established for you. When God gives you his word, and you decree and declare that prophetic word from the scripture, powerful things happen. Things are established in the spirit. I think of Elijah, last time we were together, we talked about Elijah, where Elijah prevailed in prayer to see rain come. But before that, on Mount Carmel, the same place, he takes on the prophets of Baal. He prays a very simple prayer, declares a prophetic decree, and fire comes from heaven and consumes the sacrifice instantaneously. And there are times like that. Jesus operated in that. Again and again, you see in the ministry of Jesus that he has a word of knowledge. He has a prophetic decree. He declares it and it comes to pass. He curses a fig tree and it immediately begins to wither. He speaks to a paralytic and he's immediately healed. He speaks to a storm and it's immediately stilled. God gave him, the Father gave him a word. Jesus proclaimed it and it came to pass. Now, Jesus' miracles were not always instantaneous, including his healing miracles, but so often it was. Now, understand, Jesus was a unique son of God. Jesus had the spirit, as John says, without measure. Now, we have it with measure. Yet, when you look at the lives of the apostles, you see a very similar thing happen. Peter and John go to the 
beautiful gate. And there they see a lame man and they say, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And the man does it immediately, instantaneously, because they had a word of knowledge and a prophetic decree happens and God's word is established. And that can happen in our lives. I think we saw this beautifully displayed when we have had multiple times Mario Murillo come to minister here in Colorado Springs. He's coming again later this year. And we love having him because he's a true New Testament evangelist. His heart, his passion, his souls, reaching the lost. And every time he ministers, hundreds of people come to Christ in big auditoriums. Dozens of people come to Christ in small auditoriums. But every time you see people giving their lives to Jesus Christ. But not only is he an evangelist in the sense of seeing people come to Christ, but he operates in what the Bible calls signs and wonders. And the primary way Mario operates is these prophetic decrees. God gives him a word of knowledge. He knows what's going on in someone's life, and it is astonishing. Let me give you one example, and I could give you a half a dozen of these. People who we actually know, we knew their story, who Mario had a word of knowledge for, and they were miraculously healed. There was a lady named Donna Wilcox. She lived in North Carolina. Colorado, and she came because Kelly invited her to be at the tent when he was here in a, in a tent crusade, and she was sitting on the second or third row, and Mario calls her out, and he has a word of knowledge. He has a prophetic word, a word concerning her condition, and he knew exactly what she was going through, even though he'd never met her or never talked to her, and no one ever told him. And he said, you're healed in the name of Jesus. Next thing you know, Donna throws down her cane. I mean, before that, she was hobbling around, could barely get from one place to another. She said she had never gone more than a minute without severe pain. And all of a sudden, she throws down her cane. She's moving around. She's, I mean, this woman's in her 60s, and she's dancing like a teenager. She is healed instantaneously by the power of God. Now, let me also say this. I know people where they received a word of knowledge, and it wasn't quite right. It was sort of right, but it wasn't quite right. But, you know, you even see that in the Bible. When um, there was a prophet of the New Testament, and when he gave his prophetic word, it wasn't quite exactly what happened, but it was close. And you know why that is? It's dust and divinity. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. So when Agabus gave the prophecy, it wasn't perfectly right, but it was close because sometimes we can miss it because we're human beings. Can, can anybody say you've ever missed it before? And so I, I have such respect for Mario that he would get up and in crowds of hundreds, and we've seen in crowds of thousands, he would, in front of everybody, make a bold proclamation. He would make a prophetic decree, even though he knows he may have missed it. And sometimes people are not healed, probably more than not. But does that discredit it? No, it just shows it's dust and divinity. We're human beings. But he had the courage to step out. But it's not just some gifted signs and wonders evangelist. God will do this in your life. I've seen it in my life multiple times. You know, there was a time when Kelly had horrific warts on her body, I mean, particularly on her hands. She had these terrible warts. And she said, you know, if Jesus can curse a fig tree, I can curse warts. She started cursing those warts, and every one of them left her body. Isn't that incredible? It was just one day, it was like God spoke to her. And it's like, if Jesus can curse fig trees, you can curse warts. And they left her. Another time, uh, this was years ago when I was in my 20s. Not that many years ago, but um, it's all relative, right? It's all relative. I uh, was having tremendous foot pain. And I'm somebody who loves to walk. I typically go on long walks every day I can. And it was a beautiful time of the year. And I wasn't getting my walks. And my foot was in horrible pain. And I turned on the television, and I was watching a televangelist, but this guy actually was on a talk show. And I knew the man, and I knew that God was using him in an extraordinary way in healing. And all of a sudden, he just says, there's somebody with foot pain, and God is healing them. Well, I said, that's for me. I believe that was a prophetic decree. I believe it was a word of knowledge for me. So I jumped up on my foot, and I went, ah! 
And then I said, in the name of Jesus, I am healed. I slammed it again, and it wasn't as painful. I did it a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, and next thing you know, I don't have an ounce of pain in my feet. That day I went on a five-mile walk because there is a prophetic decree, a word from God, and it comes to pass. Kelly and I had that same experience one night when we were laying in bed again watching some uh, television program, and there was a guest on. Again, it was a, a talk show, and this guy was talking about healing miracles, and Kelly had been dealing with serious pain in her shoulder. And the man said, someone is being healed of shoulder pain. And Kelly said, I'll receive that. And she threw her arm up, and all the pain completely left her. Now, all of you are going to go home, turn on your television, and look for pain. No, no, that's not the point. The point is that there is a word of faith, that we declare a word. Well, let me show you in the scripture. Look at Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24. Jesus says this, have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, and I think the best way to see that are mountains in our life, obstacles, difficulties, challenges, whatever your mountain may be. Be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done, he'll have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. Now, what is Jesus saying there? First of all, he says not that you are to say, God, please remove the mountain, but you're to say to the mountain. Just like Jesus spoke to the fig tree, just like he spoke to the storm, just like Kelly spoke to the warts. There are times when God gives you a prophetic decree, you say it, and many times instantaneously things will happen. It's an incredible thing. And then he says that we're to pray, and what do we receive? The things we believe we receive, that's what we receive. That's what we get. What we believe we receive when we pray. Faith is involved. Faith. Faith is a gift of God. There is actually the gift of faith. But faith also comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It comes from experiencing God and what he's done. It's faith, not in our faith, but faith in his faithfulness because he's a faithful God. And when he gives us a word from God and we declare that word in faith, amazing things happen. So prophetic decrees, they're powerful. They're life-changing. They are authoritative commands in prayer. When you know you've heard from God, when you know you have a word from God, you can decree it, you can declare it in Jesus' name. A third weapon is fasting and prayer. Now, we have said here at Radiant, during our 21 days of prayer and fasting, set aside other things in order to pursue God. But biblically, fasting is setting aside food for a spiritual purpose. And we see throughout the scripture the power of fasting. Now, I got to say, there is the discipline of fasting. I know in my own life, I try to regularly fast for one day, uh, typically three times a month, where I set aside a meal and, and fast under the Lord. That's the spiritual discipline of fasting. But then there's spiritual surges where you're saying, we're going to pull down strongholds. We're going to see things happen that we must press into at this time. That's what we're doing right now. Typically at Radiant Church, twice a year, we either go on a 21 or 40 day fast. And people fast in various ways. They set aside food in various ways, whether it be what they call a Daniel fast, which is kind of just eating things that come from a seed or your own version of Daniel fasting, or a liquid fast, and some people even fast on nothing but water. But it's setting aside food for a spiritual purpose, and there is a reason for it. It is a weapon. It's not just a spiritual discipline. I believe it is a stronghold buster. It is a spiritual nuclear weapon to pull down strongholds. I say that because of Isaiah 58, verse 6. Isaiah 58 is a wonderful chapter if you want to learn about the right motives for fasting and the results of fasting. But it says in verse 6, is this not the fast that I've chosen, God speaking, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? How many know of strongholds that need to be broken? Yokes that need to be removed? Fasting is what can do that. 
Daniel demonstrated that in Daniel chapter 10 when he went on what we call a Daniel fast for 21 days where he set aside other things. He didn't eat any pleasant food. In fact, he didn't even bathe for 21 days. I do not recommend that. But Daniel did it. And at the end of that 21 days, the angel Gabriel comes to him. And he said the reason it took 21 days is there was war in the heavenlies. It's almost like God took this chapter, pulled the veil back, and let us see into the spiritual realm. I wish I could see into the spiritual realm. I wish I had an app on my phone. Maybe Spirit World app. I don't know. But I could, I could look at it, and as I prayed, I get to see what's happening. Wouldn't that be so cool? Could someone invent that app? That would be amazing. Oh, look at, look at Michael. Oh, oh, in the name of Jesus. I, I mean, it would inspire my prayers. But what you've got to realize is that is going on, whether you can see it or not. We see it here in Daniel. He said there was a prince of Persia who was withstanding Gabriel from coming and bringing the answer. So Michael, the archangel, has to come through Daniel's prayers to defeat the prince of Persia. Folks, there is spiritual battles going on in the heavenlies. I can't fully explain them, but we can pierce the darkness with our prayers. We can bring down strongholds. We can break the shackles of darkness. So fasting and prayer is an amazing weapon in God's arsenal. Fourth of all, praying in the spirit. That's the fourth weapon. And what is praying in the spirit? Well, we know it's important because Paul said we're to put on this whole armor, praying always with all prayer and supplication. And he said, in the spirit. I believe one way to pray in the spirit is to be led by the spirit, to be directed by the spirit in your prayers. And some of you, this is going to be really helpful. Because I know sometimes when you're praying, thoughts come to your mind and you think, oh, I shouldn't be thinking that. But sometimes those thoughts are actually coming from your spirit. God is speaking to you and directing you in prayer. All of a sudden, the nation of Malawi comes to your mind. And you're thinking, why am I thinking about Malawi? Well, because God wants you to pray for Malawi. Or maybe a, a picture of a person comes to your mind, some friend, someone you know. It's just, it's in your imagination. It's God directing you. Let him direct your prayer times. Be led by the Spirit in prayer. But, but I think there's another kind of being led by the Spirit in prayer. There's another kind of praying in the Spirit. And that is, Paul calls it praying in other tongues. And in some places, it's quite controversial. But let me just say, it's quite biblical. You cannot read the New Testament and not believe that the gift of tongues is valid for today. And not only that, there are millions and millions of people all over the world. There's at least, listen to this, a quarter of a billion people who we know of in the world speak in other tongues. That is not something that's a fantasy from someone's imagination. It is a real gift of God. And I do realize there's many people at Radiant Church that have never received that gift. So if you'd like to, at the end of the service, please come. Let someone pray with you, or you can wait because we're going to, in May, have a special conference on a weekend that is specifically designed to see people experience this gift, whether receiving it through the baptism of the Holy Spirit or, or releasing that gift because you've not released it in your life. But I encourage you that way. But let me just say, if you've never experienced it, it's still real. It doesn't make you better than anybody else. But I got to tell you, for me, it makes me better than I would be otherwise. And the reason I say that is because what Paul says about this gift and also what Jude says in Jude 20, he says, but you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. He's saying praying in other tongues, praying in the spirit builds you up. Also, Paul says the same in 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He says, who he who speaks in a tongue edifies or builds himself up. And to me, that's the primary purpose for it. It's primarily a private devotional prayer language. It is a, you could say, it is a language of the Spirit. That the Holy Spirit enables you to pray in a way that builds you up. And I got to tell you, I need built up. Because if I want to build up others, I need to be built up myself. And so to me, that's the primary use. But there's more uses than that. In fact, let me show you one that I think is absolutely fascinating. In the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, Paul says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him, however in the spirit 
He speaks mysteries. Now, what are mysteries? Well, they're mysterious to the person praying and those listening to him, but they're not mysterious to God. These mysteries God knows. A mystery is something that is hidden from most, but some know. God knows these mysteries. And I believe, this is my personal conviction, that you can pray in other tongues and actually be praying for things you don't know how to pray for. Because they're a mysterious language that God is praying through you to accomplish His purpose. Let me give you a personal example, and I've heard dozens of these over time. In our book, Holy Rebel, I relate this story that my wife, Kelly, one day was vacuuming the floor, minding her own business, when all of a sudden she got this incredible burden to pray for her sister, Robin. So she began to pray. She began to pace the floor. She began to pray in other tongues because she didn't know how to pray. She said, I don't know what's going on with Robin, but I'm going to pray in the Spirit. And she ferociously prayed in the Spirit. The next day, she gets a call from her sister. And her sister said, you're not going to believe what happened to me. She said, I was going down the highway with my son. And her son was very little. He was an infant. He was in the back seat in a uh, you know, car uh, carrier for children. And she's driving along the road when all of a sudden an 18-wheeler came up to the side of her and started to run her off the road. Then she would go around him and he would come back around her and try to drive her off the road. She said it was the most terrifying experience of her life. She thought her life was going to ebb away here, that there was going to be a horrible accident, that something terrible was going to happen. When all of a sudden the man veered off, went another way, took another road and left. And she found out at the time it was is the exact same time Kelly was praying in the Spirit for her. Now, some people say that's a coincidence. I believe it was God at work and that he was using the mysterious language of tongues to affect what was happening at that given time. So I encourage you to understand the value of praying in the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, Paul says, what's the conclusion then? He said, I'll pray with the Spirit, and I'll also pray with the understanding. That tells me something. If he's saying, I'll pray with the understanding, I understand it with my intellect, that's his native language or a language he knows. But when he's praying and it says he's praying in the Spirit, that's a language he doesn't know. That's other tongues. And he says, I will sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding. I'm going to share just a little picture of my own personal prayer life. Many times I will pray in the Spirit, and as I'm praying in the Spirit, I believe God gives me other things to pray for. And sometimes I believe it's the operation of the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. That God gives me the interpretation of what I am praying in other tongues so that I can more intelligently pray in English for a given situation. I heard Earl Roberts years ago, the founder of Earl Roberts University, uh, at one time a great signs and wonders evangelist himself. He said that uh, he would pray in the Spirit, and God would give him an interpretation of tongues, and it guided and directed him in some of the greatest decisions he made in his life and ministry. Now, that's fascinating. I've never really had that experience, but I've had the experience of God dropping things into my spirit as I pray in the spirit because it's a weapon. It's a weapon that we need to employ. Finally, I want to talk about a very similar weapon. This is the last one, and it is the prayer weapon of travail. In John 16, verses 20 to 22, Jesus says, most assuredly, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. He's talking about his crucifixion. The world's going to rejoice when Jesus dies, but he's going to rise from the dead, and they're no longer going to be sorrowful. They're going to be filled with joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Now, this expression Jesus is using here of labor, I think is important when it comes to prayer, because the principle is true in our prayer lives. 
You can go into a time of prayer labor, intense prayer. Prayer where you're actually birthing something. A woman in labor is going to give birth to a baby. And she doesn't quit laboring when she gets tired of laboring. She quits laboring after the baby's born. And when you get into prayer labor, where God has put something in your heart, and you're pressing in in prayer, don't quit until the answer comes. And God will empower. This is supernatural prayer. This is prayer beyond normal prayer. It's when God anoints you to pray over a situation. And I've had times, and maybe some of you have, where you pulled away and there's a burden in prayer. There's an agony in prayer. You know you're birthing something in the realm of the Spirit as you pray and cry out to God. I, I want you to see what we read in Daniel 7.15. Daniel said, I was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I believe this kind of prayer can affect your physical body. It can affect your physical body. In Galatians 4.19, Paul said he travailed in prayer for the Galatians. In 1 Thessalonians 3.10, this scripture you've got to write down. You've got to mark this one. Paul's talking about praying for the church. And he says, night and day praying, and look at this next word, exceedingly. Now, I saw that word. I thought, i got to know what that means. So I took out some very scholarly lexicons to find out what that word means. Let me give you some definitions of exceedingly. Greatly. Excessively. Extremely loudly. <laughs> and then, here's my favorite one. Insanely furious. Have you ever prayed insanely furious? This is serious business. This is warfare. This is battle. Someone in a battle uses all the ammunition they have when their life is on the line. Folks, lives are on the line. We need to be intensely furious in prayer at times. Romans 8.26, Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I believe He's talking about this travail. Where out of your spirit, the depths of your being, you're crying out to God. And the Holy Spirit uses that to fulfill the will of God. It is a weapon. Folks, it's time to bring out the big guns. It's time for us to get serious in this warfare, in this battle. Let, let me say this. Those people meeting at Davos, Switzerland, are sitting around, and they believe they're shaping history. They're going to shape people's destiny. They're going to shape your life. They're engaged in trying to make a difference in the way they believe it should be made. But let me say, there are people who read history. How many of you like to read history? I love to read history. There's other people, and I know some people like this, who have written history. But let me say, you and I can be the people who make history. We can be history shapers. We can be world changers. We can be those who change the destiny of this planet, who change the direction of this nation, who see people translated from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his dear son. Those headed toward a devil's hell changed and turned the other way to become followers of Jesus Christ through prayer. The weapons of our warfare are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds and you have the key, you have the gift, you have the ability in prayer to do just that. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for every person listening to me at this time, whether on radio, whether on the internet, whether right here in this auditorium. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give us such a passion to be difference makers, such a desire to be used by Almighty God that we would become prayer warriors strong in you and the power of your might, that we would be destiny shapers, that we would be history makers in the realm of the Spirit. And Father, I pray for your hand of anointing and blessing to come upon every individual touched by this message today to empower and enable them in prayer. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.